grace and peace of God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's something terribly unfinished about this, isn't there? That agony of that day was so visible to all of those people that were watching. Some that were very pleased and very happy because finally they thought that they had justice for this blasphemer, for this person who was grasping away from them the power that they had and that they wanted. Some perhaps with the idea that what they believed in was pure and holy and what Jesus, the promised Messiah, was not. But it would seem that it was mainly a matter of power and greed and stubbornness and sinfulness. And the question I'm sure was asked is I ask myself as we go back and we see somewhat, perhaps distantly, but yet somewhat, the agony and the sacrifice and the sorrow. And we ask that question. Why, Lord? Or why God? Why Abba? Why your son? Certainly there could have been an easier way, it would seem. And you could have kind of all dressed it up. I know I'm talking foolishness. This was the way. This was the way. Jesus had to become true man, true God. Jesus had to become our, in place of us, the one who, who came and who brought justice for the sins that we committed and have committed. And so Jesus was there, exhausted, ready, so ready to be done, but yet not my will, but God's will. There certainly are times not to ever compare ourselves to the Lord as far as what he went through and what we sometimes with suffering go through. But there is that the strength that we know that what, what he has done was for us and certainly our suffering, although not earning us anything as, as far as a sense of our salvation, but yet the hope that is there because this man, this God suffered for us. And it was real. It was real. Now, I like to kind of dress it up and say, well, this is God, and, and you know he can handle those things, but it was real. He was true man, true God. He had the same pain that we would have as spikes would be driven through our hands, our wrists. But what it was for was not for a false reason. And there are people who die for false reasons. But his was blessed by God, prophesied by God, promised by God, given to us by God. So that on that particular day, which we now know as Good Friday, he was put on that cross. And as we look at that day, there's different accounts. And perhaps the crucifixion was actually, the part that he was actually on the cross might have been a little bit shorter but it would appear that it began, according to Mark at least, that it began at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then, what was happening at 9 o'clock in the morning? Some of those things are put in your handout if you care to look at that. The soldiers were dividing up his clothes. He did say seven different things, not all which are recorded on your handout, but he said seven different things. Now, during this process... He was bleeding. And at one time, we were kind of taught that the bleeding was not the thing that was most difficult. It was the pain. It was the nails going through the, and, and penetrating a nerve in, in his wrist and the, and the angst of that and, and, the, and the soreness that he felt and, and the stripes on his back. We were taught, and I think logically, that what was most difficult was breathing because he was hanging. Recently, as I read, as doctors take a look at this and try to figure out exactly what was going on, the most recent one that I've read is that uh, he feels, and he's a medical doctor, 
And he feels that probably what Jesus died of was not the lack of breath, not able to breathe, although certainly that seemed to be a major force. But he says since he could speak, it probably wasn't that, but it was the blood, the amount of blood that he lost. What we know for sure is that Jesus was on the cross. Our sins were with him. Jesus was on the cross, and he did die for us. Paul uses the words propitiation. It was because something had to be done for us. It was a gift for us. While he was on the cross, he could see and hear what was going on around him. As I began to say, the soldiers divided up his clothes, and then even then in his mercifulness, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, meaning everybody, the executioners, those that were jeering and yelling at him and saying, you, you know, you're the son of God. Take yourself off of the cross. They were taunting him. They were ridiculing him. Even one of the prisoners who was hanging on the cross besides him did the same thing. And then we have that marvelous story about the other prisoners saying, why are you tormenting this man who has done nothing when we have done, we're being punished for what we actually did? Then he says to Jesus, remember me. You know, that's our cry, isn't it? Remember me. That's why Jesus got so personal coming to this earth, being on this cross, bleeding. That's why he wanted that relationship with us. So that he, to that prisoner, these words, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. As he tells us the truth, as we believe and as we understand, we will be with our Lord and Savior in paradise. The sky darkens. It's noon. He looks to his mother and says, Dear woman, here is your son. And he looks to John, who's standing right next to him, and he says, Son, here is your mother. Soon after that, he says the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. Again, as we sometimes struggle with our loneliness and our feeling that nobody knows our situation, Jesus went through that. Jesus actually felt that. And so knowing that he not only felt that, but that he, as our Christ, as our God, as our Savior, is there with us in during those dark times, or during those times when we're consoling those and we don't know what to say. Jesus is there. As the, as the sky darkens, as it became darker and darker, the words, the last words came. Father, into your hand I command my spirit. I commit my spirit. And then... For the first time, he took a bit of the vinegar, the wine that had turned old, after he said the words, I am thirsty. And then says the word, it is finished. It is finished. The centurion who had organized the whole procedure, who had made sure that the execution was done right, who made sure that nobody interfered, the executioner looks up and says, this truly was the Son of God. Now, I don't know for sure if he would have said these words also, but I think they are appropriate. And those words are true for us also. These words are this, My God, I killed your son. My God.
there's something about this that is incomplete. For each and every nail, for each and every personal message that is on here, God has an answer. God did answer. There is no sin that is on here that has not been forgiven. This is the point, isn't it? This is the point. So as we feel the remorse, as we understand the pain, as we see what God has done for us, we also see that glorious end. And that's why we'll burn these up, because we know that in three days, this Son of God, who said it was finished, was only saying it for that part of his earthly life, and then again, and then again, he would be come from the tomb and be there with us, for us, in all eternity.